Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. So welcome back to another episode of The No Show. Uh, my name is Hussein Ayed, and I'm really pleased to be joined today by a professor in economics at SOAS University whose work is incredibly important because he looks at an aspect of economics that isn't widely researched. And this aspect is anti-corruption. Um, so thank you so much for joining me, uh, Professor Mushtaq. Um, and I'm really pleased that you are joining us. Um, so th thank you so much for being here. Um, could you give us a little bit of a background about um, how you came to sort of researching anti-corruption and, and what were the, the motivators behind that? Well, it might sound a bit sad, but I've been interested in corruption and anti-corruption all of my academic life. I began, my PhD was on comparing um, Pakistan, which included Bangladesh in the 1960s with South Korea in the 1960s and looking at the different development trajectories of these two countries, um, both of them were superficially quite similar. They had military governments, they had um, high levels of corruption, they had very state-driven um, development programs, they were trying to develop a small number of global champion firms in export sectors. Both countries had started off with high rates of growth. In fact, Pakistan's development model was the model on which the South Koreans based their development model, mm -hmm. but the Pakistan growth model collapsed and the South Korean one continued and, and we know where they have reached now. And so my question was, why did corruption have such different effects in these different countries? Um, and the answer which I developed then and has, have been developing ever since is that the effects of corruption depend very much on the underlying political settlement, on the distribution of power in that society who is corrupt and what constrains them and how are they using the informal methods of doing business? Are they doing it in a productive way or in a, a damaging way? Is it socially divisive? Is it develop, de delivering jobs? From that initial um, research, I have developed a whole series of, of works on different aspects of rents and rent seeking, which is all of this is about how states create benefits for different groups and how they try and capture these benefits and what the implications of that are. And finally, into applied anti-corruption, which is using all of this knowledge to ask a, a, a question that if you're in a country which is very vulnerable, so we really need not be that concerned about the Chinas and the South Koreas, because even though they have corruption, they have ways of overcoming it internally much more important other countries where the corruption is blocking their development, like the Pakistans of the 1960s, or countries today um, that we are studying, like Nigeria and Bangladesh, and, and actually most of the developing world is quite similar, where the corruption seems to be blocking development very severely, and there's no clear answer of how to exit from that. And most of the answers that have been provided have looked at the experience of much more advanced countries and the instruments that we are expected to impose are from the more advanced countries. So things like you need to have transparency, you need to have accountability, you need to have democracy, you need to have strong institutions, you need to have a rule of law. Yes, but the problem is that none of these things work because if you have a lot of corruption, you don't have a rule of law. So to say that you need a rule of law doesn't answer the question of how you get the rule of law. If you have a lot of corruption, your courts don't work, your judges are corrupt, your police is corrupt. So who is going to catch the corrupt simply by saying we need to punish them and so on, right? So you then get trapped in this kind of circularity where you're saying we need transparency, but then when you expose the corruption, who is going to take action on that? Because every, the politicians and the police and the judges are all involved in that corruption. 
So revealing the transparency aspect of it doesn't lead to accountability. And this has been where the whole debate has been trapped for a long time. But in the last 10 years or so, a lot of research has been done by many people which have shown that the standard approaches to anti-corruption aren't working. And then all the research that people like myself have been doing in the past comes to the fore because that's exactly what we've been saying. We've been saying, look, corruption is structural to the way power is configured in these societies. Mm. If all the powerful people are engaged in this corruption, how are you going to do the anti-corruption? Because the powerful people go and say, you know, yes, we want to fight corruption, but they're all engaged in corruption themselves. So when you actually set up these institutions, they don't work because the powerful people don't want them to work. So this is a trap. So what we are doing in this research project, which is the Anti-Corruption Evidence Program, it's an FCDO funded research program, it used to be DFID, but now it's the FCDO. Um, it's looking at how to do feasible anti-corruption in developing countries. And the basic idea is this. The basic idea that we have is that if you have a country, which is like most developing countries, where powerful groups for, for a whole bunch of structural reasons don't need a rule of law and don't want a rule of law because the way they make their money and they are doing their accumulation doesn't require the enforcement of rules on everyone. You are not going to get them to enforce rules simply because you are paying them some development money to do that, mm -hmm. right? So, so that approach is completely flawed. What we say is that if you look at the history of the countries which have actually reduced corruption in the past, not only the South Koreas, but also if you go back long enough in the history of the UK or the US, the way it actually happened is that the, the fight against corruption was driven by one group of powerful people fighting another group of powerful people because some people who had the interest um, from rules uh, and, and rule following behavior were being thwarted by other people who were benefiting from breaking the rules. So you have to look at conflicts of interest within the people who are engaged in different activities. And you have to support the, or you have to nudge the behavior of those who are more likely to support rule following behavior in their own interest. And this is the really critical observation. <clears throat> no one is going to fight corruption or not no one, but most people won't fight corruption simply because it's in the public interest. If it's not in their interest, if it's not in my interest, I'm not going to spend my time and resources and take the risks involved in doing this simply because it's in the public interest. And secondly, while many people are willing to do that in a developing country, most of the people who are willing to do that actually have very little power. They are people who are at the receiving end of the corruption, but that also means that they have very little power to change things because they can be very easily sidelined and ignored. So what you have to do is to build a coalition between the majority of people who don't want, who don't benefit from corruption and some people who have some amount of power, but who want to fight a particular type of corruption in their own interest. If you can make that coalition, then you can get some people with influence to check and balance other people with influence. And that's how anti-corruption actually becomes real. And so our research is looking for opportunities where it's not just pointing out the corruption, Everybody knows where the corruption is. It's not even just pointing out the causes of the corruption. We have a lot of research on that and we know the causes of corruption. The problem is you can't do anti-corruption by trying to reverse the causes of corruption. This is where it doesn't work. So if I know that the corruption is happening because there's no transparency, or I know the corruption is happening because there's no accountability, it doesn't follow that I can fight the corruption by saying I want accountability or I want, because mm -hmm. that's not clear how you get there. Yeah. The only way you can fight it is by finding a mechanism that you can actually reverse. That is, you, you find a mechanism that is feasible in a policy sense to do something different with, mm. which will then change behavior which is real and not rhetorical blah, blah, yes, we are all for anti-corruption, which they all say, but nothing happens. This is very interesting. I, I think one of the most interesting sort of um, points that I've heard in recent times is is one that you've presented where you say you have to check corruption by you know pitting powerful people against powerful people. So how much does does that speak to 
for the for the lack of a better term, manipulating the existing system so that you reach a better situation. Because fundamentally, in a corrupt in corrupt society, in corrupt environments, let's not call it societies, but environments, whether it's in Nigeria, whether it's in Pakistan, or whether it's in Iraq or anywhere in the developing world. It's the system that's the problem. So it's it's your what you're saying is you essentially have to manipulate the system without trying to just you know force a change. You're absolutely right, and I think that that the, the reason why we say that that it has to be incremental is because the the pathology that you are observing, which is that people aren't following rules, is not because some people are culturally or morally not motivated to follow the rules. It's that the logic of the system is you don't follow the rules. And the reason, the most important factor that is causing that, let me take a step back and say, when do people start following the rules? In, historically, when have societies started to follow rules in a broad-based way? And here is not just my work, but also the work of people like Douglas North and, and his colleagues coming from a very different tradition of new institutional economics came up with this idea of the open access order, right? And in, in, our, in my terminology, we, I describe it as the political settlement becoming a, a rule following or a rule of law political settlement. When does it happen? It happens when you have a society that is so complex that you have thousands of productive enterprises which are running complex operations inside themselves and with each other and they can no longer operate these complex systems based on I know you and you know someone else. You need to have contracts and those contracts have to be enforced by somebody because without those contracts, you can't do your business. As soon as your society becomes complex to that point where you need to have third party enforcement as it's called in, in institutional economics jargon, you need to have rules which somebody else can enforce or you can't make money or you can't do business. The powerful then want rules in their own interest. They want rules not because they like rules, but because they can't survive without them. Mm -hmm. And as soon as that happens, the economy becomes more and more rule following and politics becomes more rule following because the, politics, the politicians have to answer to people who are paying them the taxes and their, and their funds for their politics, who are all rule following. So they want their politicians to be rule following. Otherwise they undermine the very system, which is laying the eggs which the politicians are, are using. That's absolutely not the situation in a developing country. 80% of the economy is in the informal sector, which means that most of the firms in your economy are so unproductive, have such low productivity that they can't even register themselves. Forget about following any other rules. 80%. Now, if 80% of your economy is in the informal sector, who, who are you imposing the rules on? Mm. And the 20% that is in the formal sector are a few large companies mostly, which are not very productive. They don't need a lot of rules. They all know each other. So I know you are a thief, you know I am a thief, but I can sell you my cement and you can pay me because I know there's nowhere you can run because if you don't pay me, I will get the mafia to extract the money from you or I will get some informal ways of enforcing my contract with you. I don't need a complex contract enforcement system, right? Mm -hmm. So the powerful in a developing country can do their business with informal contracts. Most of the economy is informal. The politicians get most of their money informally. So nobody is really interested in enforcing rules. So, it's, so, so the reason why you have to go incrementally is because we have a bigger theory of change underlying all this, which is that what we are trying to do is to use these nudges to make society more productive, to have more productive organizations and the more productive organizations you have, which need complex rules, not only are you going to have those subsectors interested in rules, you're going to get a society which is increasingly going to say, we need rules. And at, at some critical turning point, you move from a society which is doing lots of ad hoc anti-corruption to one is, which is going to do systemic anti-corruption. And that's the transition that South Korea made sometime in the 2000s and late 1990s from a society which was extremely corrupt in the 1960s to one where the growing Chebol, the, the, the big players like Hyundai and Samsung and so on, built up systems of rule following behavior to one where actually they were saying the whole system now needs to be rule following. 
right? So there is a sequence and you can see that same thing happening in China. Gradually it's trying, the pressure for more rule following behavior is increasing. Unfortunately, in most developing countries, even the pockets of rule following behavior are developing. And what we are saying is that you need to build those pockets of rule following behavior where the players themselves will start following rules in their own interest as a way of raising productivity. And as those productivity pockets increase, you will get more and more social support for what we all want, which is genuine rule of law, which is everybody follows rules all the time because the, the society wants the enforcement of rules. That doesn't mean you will not have a corruption in the US or the UK or wherever. I mean, we, we, we are seeing right now, Mr. Trump trying to break lots of rules, but the difference in, in the advanced countries that lots of other powerful institutions exist, which will check and balance the people yeah. who are trying to break the rules. Whereas in a developing country, those checks and balances don't happen because power is not in the real economy, not dispersed widely enough. The, what's really interesting uh, in the examples that you used is in developing countries, there's such a significantly large amount of uh, transactions or, or interactions happening in the informal sector. Now, in a situation like that, from, from your research and your experience, how do you sort of shift that into a formal sector? Do you need the big players to participate first or can you start off with the smaller ones? Yes, so I think another bit of research that we are doing and this is really important is that it's very dangerous to think you can rapidly transform the informal sector into the formal sector with a quick fix. A number of countries are trying to do that. For example, using digital technologies and putting taxation onto digital platforms and then forcing the informal economy into the formal economy by registering them for tax and, and so on, or national ID cards and things like that. There is a real danger with that because for us, the reason why most of these people are in the informal economy is not because they've chosen to not follow rules. They don't have the productivity and the capability to follow rules. In other words, they're not the capacity of producing a productive enterprise is missing, right? So if, you, if your business doesn't generate enough revenue, if your productivity isn't high enough, then conforming with and applying rules has a cost. These costs are something as simple as keeping records, keeping a book, accounting, right? Now, if you imagine yourself to be a peanut seller in a big capital city of a developing country, with a basket of peanuts on the road, your productivity, your revenue per day isn't enough for you to keep records of anything. Mm -hmm. now, so there's no way you can, so when you say let's formalize it by giving this person an ID card and then checking where the peanuts are being bought and sold and deduct the tax electronically, the most likely outcome of that is that this person will go out of business. There's no way that that kind of that kind of firm, that kind of productivity, can sustain the fixed costs of a, a system that is compliant with rules. So our strategy, the one that we are trying to push, and there's a huge amount of debate in this in the literature, as you would expect. Some people think that you can solve this problem by forcing formalization on the informal sector. We are very strongly against that. We think that the the way you need to do this is by parallel strategies. You must have very um, strong strategy of raising the productivity and capabilities of the productive sectors. This includes the informal economy. So I would begin by helping the peanut seller or the peanut pro processor or the peanut farmer in, the, in that chain, each of them to raise their productivity, to become more capable. And that means investment, not only in machines and skills, but also in organizational capabilities, which is a really mm -hmm. binding constraint in developing countries, knowing how to do business. That knowledge, once you start raising their capability, you will then come to a point where some of these people will voluntarily decide to register themselves because registration has benefits. You can go and raise money from a bank more easily. You can transact with other people. You can write contracts, but it has to be driven by the interest of that person yeah. being met. If you don't have that capability and you force the enforcement of formalization, you can do a lot of damage. And, and the sad thing is a lot of countries 
misunderstanding the transition of how it happens are forcing formalization. It's a process. We have written some recent papers where we describe this as premature formalization. And premature formalization is what you see in countries like Tanzania and India and others where tax systems and, and registration systems are being forced down the throats of people who are not yet ready to pay the costs of that compliance. And many of them are going out of business. A lot of SMEs are closing down. That's the wrong approach. But in the long run, of course, society needs to be formalized. And the, but the transition path to that is through raising capabilities and through making businesses more competitive. And then by themselves, they will want registration and formalization. It, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and it sort of speaks to the fact that um, who governments think about first, because, or, or what governments think about first, because from what I'm understanding from you, is it's, it's a very bottom up approach to solving the issue as opposed to the top down approach where we're saying we need to think about the tax dollars first or the tax income first before we think about the product and you're saying actually no the productivity is what comes first and actually the irony is that they will not actually collect more tax because by killing a lot of businesses um, and creating a lot of hardship they will have to use a lot of the tax money that they have in welfare programs and in and preventing serious hardship at the bottom of society. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not a good strategy. And I think that we will hear more about the implications of some of these strategies that are being tried out soon. Uh, I mean, one of the things that I, I think stands out um, in, in your work is the emphasis on incentive and incentivizing the individual. And, and obviously you've done work on anti-corruption, but you've also done work on, on the incentives within sort of um, climate management or climate change projects and how the incentive to sort of oversee these projects and, and the management of these projects has to be within the communities and it's not just some, you know, metric. I think this is something that people often forget, that if you look at an advanced country, most of the monitoring and checking is happening by peers, citizens looking at each other. So what happens in, in the UK is when a shopkeeper suspects that the neighboring shopkeeper is not paying their VAT or is running a scam, it's they who will, who will be most angry and, and report it, right? And the reason why this happens is because for a broad range of things, and this includes why people stand in queues, if you break a queue, it's not the police who comes and stops you, is the person behind you and the person in front of you who drags you back and says, please stay, stay in the queue. Most of the rule following behavior that we are used to in advanced countries is happening because our peers are enforcing rules on each other, right? Now, the problem in a developing country is because of these asymmetries of power, because of the fact that the economy is largely informal, because the fact that most people are hiding something and breaking some rule. When you see somebody breaking a rule, you don't drag him back in the queue. Right, Because the problem in a developing country is that everybody has something to hide. So if the peanut seller goes to the president and say, you are hiding something, Mr. President, the president tells the peanut seller, you're not registered to sell peanuts, so I'll shut you up. Mm. So, so everybody is breaking some rules, and therefore this peer group monitoring doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And what we are saying is you start that process, you start that process by selecting and identifying sectors where there is an opportunity of peer group monitoring, because that's the most effective way of anti-corruption or any kind of rule following behavior is when the, your peers are following rules and they say, you're the free rider, that's when the free riding stops. So, and, and what we find is that there are a huge number of such opportunities. In the climate change projects, we found that those climate change projects where the community gets involved because of their self-interest and they want to see the project well completed, you have a staggering drop in corruption. And those where the immediate uses of those um, projects is not aligned with what the community wants, the community is not interested, powerful people then can rip off the money and steal the, the resources in these projects. And no one calls them to account because it's not in anybody's interest and everyone has something to hide. So, so that's a, a principle which I think is underexploited when we start thinking of anti-corruption in these developing country contexts. We have to ask ourselves, where are the places where 
with a small change in the design of the policy, with a small change in the incentives, we can actually start getting the people who are powerful to start checking each other. And by the powerful, you see, Hussein, I mean, it's important to understand by the powerful, power is a relative concept. You know, when we are talking about remote villages in Bangladesh, a powerful person is someone who has 0.5 hectare of land. You know, that's a powerful. In the global context, this is a very poor person, right? So it's not about rich and poor. But in that community, that person has cap capability. That person is the one that the local politician listens to. So, so you need to mobilize the person who has a voice in that community. That's what we mean by power. We don't mean by power the president and the no, it's heads of relative. corporation. It's relative. So it's, it's asking who has voice in this activity? How do we get the people with voice to get involved? And then get them in the, make sure that their involvement is aligned with their interests. Because the best way to ensure that people are going to do the right thing is when doing the right thing is also in my interest. If you ask someone to do the right thing by harming themselves, you might get some really good moral people once in a while doing that. Most of the time it won't work. And most morality is, is protected best when being moral is also aligned with our long-term mm -hmm. interests. And I think that alignment of morality with the long-term, you know, the self in, um, what is the word for it? The um, informed self-interest is the best guarantee of moral behavior. That is, if I build this properly, it is not only in my interest, it's in the community's interest, it's also the right thing to do, is what it, that package then becomes a very strong package. And that's why we, we stress incentives, but incentives in the context of understanding the local power dynamics and the local economics. So to do anti-corruption, in fact, to do any policy um, package in a developing country properly, you need to understand the power dynamics, you need to understand the economics, and you need to understand what is feasible. And once you do that, you can find lots of interesting things to do. Can, can I ask you a question that is, is one that I've um, been debating a lot lately, um, like in incredible amounts from, uh, amongst friends and, and people back home and that sort of stuff. Uh, because there's this mindset, or the, especially amongst us, like our communities from the developing world who live here, or there's this, there's this sort of uh, perception that culturally we are more susceptible to corruption and culturally we are more susceptible to live in systems where the rule of law doesn't exist. Can you comment on that? I disagree with it intensely. I completely disagree with it. Because I think that, you know, there are endless examples of people who make the transition from one space to another space, and they acquire the characteristics of the place that they're in very, very quickly. So we all know that, you know, when people come from developing countries to advanced countries, most of them become rule following very quickly, right? So there's nothing cultural about it. But let me give you a very interesting example of a transition in the opposite direction, right? So I travel a lot in developing countries and developing countries are very schizophrenic in the sense that you know whether you need to follow the rules or not, mm -hmm. depending on where you are, right? So depending on the, on the local power configuration, you either follow rules or you don't follow rules. And that's exactly what we've been talking about so far. It's, it's, it's really about power and interests at each level. So if you're in a rural boondocks area of a developing country, the buses come every three or four hours. There is a mad rush to get on them when they come. And the more powerful will get on first and they will push their way and no one can stop them. If you're standing for a bus in the capital city, again, Bangladesh, which is where I'm from, you stand in line. The buses will come 15 minutes or, or so later. And most of the people standing in the queue have the same amount of social status and power. If you try to jump, people will just drag you back and say, what the hell are you doing? Mm -hmm. right? So you automatically know here I follow the rules and there I don't follow the rules. If you're in a rural area and you are waiting in line for a bus, you'll never get it. So you will have to rush and you'll negotiate with everybody else who gets it. 
Now I was in Dhaka airport one day and we we're waiting and Dhaka airport is in the urban area, right? So it, there are rules. It looks chaotic. It looks completely confused, but actually people are following rules. So we were all standing in line, checking in to take a flight out. And this European lady, um, I think she was German or something, had been working in some development project in a remote part of Bangladesh, had picked up this idea that no one follows rules. So she came to the airport, saw this kind of slight chaos, went straight to the head of the queue, and butt out everybody else and butt in saying, here's my ticket, I'm, I'm getting in. And people standing in the queue are saying, what is this white woman doing? Why is she breaking the queue and going to the front? Ba basically, she had misunderstood that this is not a cultural thing, that it's to do with context and power and opportunity and incentives. And in the airport, you stand in line. Mm. So people were saying, you know, what should we do? Should we drag her back? And then there was a conversation in Bengali going on, you know, um, this is very rude, what, what she think. And someone said, no, 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 she's a foreigner, let her be, you know, she doesn't know. Mm. In other words, if it was cultural, she would have gone to the back and waited. It's not cultural. You figure out how other people in that area are behaving and you behave like the others because if you don't align your behavior with what others are doing, you'll be dead very soon. So because she had been in the remote areas in Bangladesh, she thought that was the normal behavior of Bangladesh. But actually, that was the behavior of people in that remote area. When you come to the capital city, the behavior is very different. This is just a small example of, you know, behavior is a collective description. So if you want to call that culture, you can call it culture. But what I'm saying is that this culture is a collective behavior, which is itself determined by opportunities and power. And that behavior will change when the opportunities and power structure changes. The most important thing to understand is there's nothing genetic about this behavior. Mm -hmm. This is a behavior which is based on, and, the, and the, the person from Northern Europe who is white, put them into that power context and they start behaving exactly like the locals because they need to get on the bus too. So when you have to get into the bus and there are no buses, you will try to get yourself onto the first bus that comes along. This is nothing genetic or even deeply cultural, but some people use culture to describe behavior. If you use culture in that way, then this is culture because you have a, a, a pattern of behavior which is aligned to what your opportunities and incentives and power structures are. And if you want to call that culture, you can. But my point is that culture will change very, very rapidly when the incentives and the power structure changes and people see a new form of behavior is now more appropriate. It changes almost overnight. This is very, very interesting. Uh, the, the re I mean, just in terms of comparing uh, the cultural dynamic or, or rather than just elucidating the fact that this is more of a power mechanism as opposed to it being culture, you know, answer so many questions, answer so many questions about why development happens, answer so many questions about why um, incentives happen why i'm as a person in the uk i'm i have so much disincentive to be corrupt and and to commit a, a certain act of um you know whether it's bribery etc uh, because my peers will, will drag me because the the rule of law will sort of question me but then they, i mean you answer so many questions that are debated day in day out and it makes so much sense so for the average for, not for the average person but but for young people for people who are just about to get into their um careers or people who are thinking to go back home or contribute to developing their countries etc what advice would you give them in in terms of understanding these dynamics i think that you know all of us want a better future but sometimes getting to that better future requires understanding how the bad present works. And, and you have to really understand the logic of the bad present because it's not anarchy. There is a logic to it. There's a reason why things are happening in this way. And then you have to say, if I want to get from this rather unpleasant present, and by the way, there are many things that you know we might want to change even in the UK and in advanced mm -hmm. countries. Mm -hmm. But before you want to change, before you can change that, you have to understand why it is thus. Why are people behaving in this way? And then you have to find ways that 
to get to the behavior that you want to get at, the kind of society you want to get to, how can you incentivize some of the people, and this is where it gets a bit tricky, some of the people you don't like, some of the people who you might be antagonistic to, how can you ca carry as many of them as possible on your journey? In other words, how can you change their incentives and their behavior so that they start behaving in a different way? Mm. Now, I, I completely understand that not all of them will change. For some of them, it is a fact you know, that you will have to have a fight and there'll be winners and losers. But if you start the fight without trying to convince anyone else or incentivizing anyone of doing something different, you will lose the fight because you will have too many people you're taking on. So if you want to win the fight and take society in the direction you want to take it, you have to first distinguish between people who are breaking the rules because they are bad people, and mm -hmm. there are some of them in every society, and those who are breaking the rules because actually there is no alternative for them, and there's no other way of making their money or doing their business or living their lives without behaving in, in that bad way. And there's a big distinction between people who are behaving in a, in a socially undesirable way because actually they have no better option and those who are doing it because they have an option, but they decide to make extra money or, or rip off extra. We need to split that. And if you can split that, and all our research on anti-corruption is doing precisely that. We're looking at those skills providers who are doing fraud, because they have to, and splitting them off from those who are doing it because they are bad. If you give most of them the opportunity of not, if you give the people who want to actually make good embankments, but are not being able to, if you want to give the doctors who want to go and serve in rural areas and who want to, but who can't and who are engaging in corruption not to, all of our research is saying that a lot of the people who are behaving in ways that are corrupt, not all of them are bad. Mm. And you need to find ways of splitting them, of giving the opportunity of those who actually want to live a normal life and not do all this hassle of corruption and so on. Can you give them a normal life with a normal living? Then you can split the people who are breaking the rules because they want to. And that is the, the same if you're fighting racism. It's the same if you're fighting any ism that you don't like. You will find a lot of people are be doing that because it's just the easy thing to do. And, and a small minority are doing it because that's what they really think needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And you need to split that. You need to find ways of saying, actually, you know, there's a better future for us. There's a better economy for us. There's more development. There's less poverty. If you can get people to behave in, in ways that are socially good, but also aligned with their interest. This is very important. And, and finding that sweet spot is not that difficult, but it requires thinking in a more creative and out of the box way. It's much easier to go and look at the world in terms of good guys and bad guys. You know, they are the corrupt people. Let's identify them. Let's prosecute them. And this always fails because you have misunderstood the dynamics of what's going on because the bad guys are really bad guys, but the good guys won't come and give evidence against them because they also have things to hide. Mm -hmm. And that's when the whole thing fails, right? So, so you need to stop thinking in terms of good guys and bad guys. Think in terms of structure and complexity Think of where you want to go to and find that feasible path. And finding that feasible path means solving the problems for people at the level of incentive so that they start behaving differently in a self-interested way. That's fantastic advice, honestly. And and it, I'm not saying this just because I'm, I'm talking to you right now, but in my opinion, this is one of the most incredible bits of research I've come across and I've spoken to hundred and and 10 academics so i think your work is really really powerful um and can lend itself you know beautifully to many many countries and, and many people around the world um where can people find you online if they want to interact with you so the easiest way is to search for mushtaq khan soas on google that will take you to my web page on uh, the the soas university you will find all my publications there the other thing is to Google for SOAS ACE, A-C-E. ACE stands for the Anti-Corruption Evidence Program. That's another bunch of research on these feasible anti-corruption approaches. So both SOAS ACE and my personal website on the, on the SOAS University platform where all my publications are. And that will also give you my email address if you want to write to me and so on. Uh, Professor Mushtaq Khan, it's been fantastic speaking to you. And I think 
as I said, your work is incredible, and I hope to have you on sometime soon. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.